right now I do have my guest on the show who is going to be with me for the entire hour at least. One of them is Ms. Marie D. Jones and Mr. Larry Flaxman are both on the show. Welcome to Inside the Jackal's Head. It is a real privilege to have you both on here. I've, I've, like I said earlier, I've been really trying to get you on for a while and I really, really appreciate you spending a little time here with us. No it's problem. good to be with you. Thank you. Now, I know we have only a little bit of time with Larry, and I know we have a full hour with you, uh, Marie, but uh, Larry, give us a little bit of a rundown on on yourself so the audience knows about you, and then we're going to go into the book, uh, Viral Mythology, which I want to really uh, touch on. I want, I want to really get in depth on that book with you, but uh, give us a little bit of, of a background on yourself so the audience, again, knows who Larry uh, Flaxman is. Oh, gosh. Um, well. It's a loaded question, I know. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's uh, that is a, a loaded question. Um well, I've been in, involved in the study and research of anomalous topics, I guess you would call it, uh, most of my life. Um, I've had an interest in that. I've, I've been serious, um, I guess probably seriously researching it for probably about 20 some odd years now. Um, I've written a bunch of books with Marie. Um, gosh, I don't even know where else to go. I mean, I, I'm... I'm just me. You can see information <laughs> about me on my website. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not good talking about myself. So I think you should ask me to introduce Larry and Larry. You know, you, you know what's you know what's funny though. I find doing this show that that is actually the hardest question to lead in oh, with. It is. That, yeah. That's why I always lead in with that question because I always like to hear the response because nobody likes to talk about themselves, right? <laughs> yeah. Larry, I mean, also, Larry is also the head of. Uh, paranormal group or see investigative group he's also a motorcycle collector what else that's cool <laughs> mm-hmm Jack, yeah, it's hard master matters. of none <laughs> 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 so uh marie tell us now a little bit about yourself oh, gosh no it's my turn i'm a writer i think that yes says you are <laughs> no I- i've been really interested in UFOs and the paranormal and, and science really since early childhood and kind of always thought the two really went together in some aspects and I just I started writing uh, when I was a teenager started getting paid to write when I was a teenager and uh, just kind of took off from there started writing nonfiction about 12 years ago and met Larry about seven years ago. We started writing together. We're on our, I think this is our seventh book. So I just wow. you know, think about what interests me and what turns me on. It's hard to write these books, as Larry will Se- tell you. Seven books you've written together already. Yeah, and I've written a few on my own. And You, you realize that's more, that's like what, how many more, Petey? That's like six more books than my boardman has read in his life. <laughs> I know. I know so well. Larry and I know so many people that come to us and say, oh, we want to write a book. We want to write a book. It's like, okay, here's here's what you do. You sit your butt down and you write it. Um, But very few people will do that. It's hard work. It it is. Look, I've been trying to write a book for about six years now. You just got to do it. And once you do it, it kind of gets almost addicting. It's I'll tell you what, I, I'm on page I'm on page one right now, and my <laughs> on uh, <laughs> fade in or <laughs> no my my page one this is how my this is how my book starts it was a dark and stormy night there you go a dog yeah. somewhere in the distance a dog was barking <laughs> you know that I'm gonna steal that that's a very good follow up line yeah, that's the good <laughs> the line to every book yeah. <laughs> now in your collaborations have you know you've been interested in uh, obviously in ufology for a while how'd you get into uh, viral mythology I'll let Larry answer it since he's on limited time here ah good job um, <laughs> my interest in viral mythology. Correct. Well, how did we write the book? Well, I, I, you know, I think that it's – it's, um, and I think Marie would agree. I think the topics that we write about all have a certain air, if you will, of, oh, mystery to them. Uh, right. The, uh, the books that we tend to write revolve around topics involving the paranormal and generally science. But, you know, when you hear the word paranormal – while most people automatically think ghosts and spooky things, it's actually much – it's a much broader uh, – you can paint that category with a much broader brush. 
And uh, viral mythology, I think, really plays into that. It plays into the that whole concept of transferring information, and it's it's really speaks to um, communicating ideas and communicating concepts uh, throughout generations and throughout uh, throughout history. So a lot of the stuff that we actually write about it really kind of connects with that. I mean, we, we've written about topics in our first and second book, 1111, and also in the resonance key. We've written about ancient structures. We've written about um, all kinds of stuff that, that all really connects back to that idea of, of information being virally transmitted. So I wouldn't necessarily say it, it was just a kind of a blatant interest. I think it was kind of an organic um, an organic process that kind of lent, lended itself to where we are now. I mean, the, the book now really, it was, Marie, well, do you want to ex- actually explain how we ended up writing the book? Well, I think, you know, we, obviously every time we finish a book, the next thing is the pub, our publisher will say, you know, what do you guys want to do next? Or yeah. we'll think about what right. we What's the follow-up? Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's how you get to write so many books. <laughs> but with this, I, I do recall Larry and I having a conversation quite a while ago, actually many of them. We both really wanted to know if there was any science, any truth or, or not, you know, real factual knowledge hidden in stories in the Bible or rel- different religious texts, the myths, the world's great myths, right. fairy tales, you know, or, because a lot of what we write about is, is hidden, hidden esoteric information, stuff that's not real visible in your face. It might even be called a cult in some circles. Occultish, but, right. Yeah. But so I just remember us talking about, well, how do we know – what uh, if, say, like the story of Noah's Ark, I'm just throwing that out as an example. Is there any truth in that? Is there actual scientific knowledge in that story about a flood that may have occurred a certain amount of time ago? Right. Uh, and was there really a Noah? And how do we how do we look at these stories of old, whether they were done through art, architecture, paintings, orally told, you know, written down in, in legends and folklore is there any truth in there is any science in there and if there is how do we find it right that's right. kind of took off now with you, uh, marie with your interest in ufology uh would you say that like some of uh, the most current uh, events and i would say current but it's still even though it's been like 60 years now or whatever uh but i say like roswell is like probably the most viral thing in ufology the most viral mythology at this point that we've had yeah uh, absolutely and we like, still don't really know what happened, do we? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a myth. Yeah. Nobody knows. <laughs> now, I mean, other other than that, in ufology, like what other uh, great myth out there uh, oh, has gone gosh, viral? All the the you know the Betty and Barney Hill story, anything real groundbreaking that um, that happened that sort of shifted the field. Cases that were really unusual. Travis Walton. Yeah, yeah, things that got made into movies. Because right. well, that's yeah. another way that you can take information viral and spread it to more people. In fact, people that may not. You know, the Travis Walton movie, Fire in the Sky, I love that movie. Now, a lot of people saw the movie that may not have even known about the actual case of what happened to him. Yeah, but right. they found out through what they thought was fiction, what they thought was a, an entertaining movie. And that's another way to transmit actual you know, factual information. You know what's crazy about that story, though, uh, Marie, is uh, if you actually, if people who've read Travis's book, uh, are, like most of us who've read the book hate the movie in, in a way uh, <laughs> because they, they change so many details from oh, actually yeah. what he wrote that happened to him compared to what they put in the movie. Uh, Travis himself, he doesn't like the movie, and, uh, you know, I, I've spoken to him about uh, him possibly uh, doing another version in the future of the movie right. and stuff. Uh, but yeah, that, I would guess that would be the big one. You know, I was talking about uh, this case earlier, and I don't want to get too into it with you with uh, YouTube because I want to keep this on a positive. But like Stan Romanek, for example, right. uh, his Alien in the Window. I mean, that went viral uh, as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
but you know, there's uh, I guess when we're talking about viral mythology, we're talking about every field, every genre, not just religion, ufology, and paranormal. Like, what other fields uh, do we have any mythological uh, things that have? Uh, I guess you can catalog. Oh, everything. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much anything. Even within yeah. the paranormal, there's there's certainly things that could be considered. Uh, viral. I think any time that has, uh, right, you know, the, absolutely. Any time you have a topic that uh, lends itself to to having multiple possible explanations, I think that you uh, you are kind of ripe for having the possibility of of that information being virally transmitted. Hmm. Well, also, like if you look at the ghost house, it really started with one. Sure. It, you know the. Taking something viral really is a what nothing more than something that becomes popular in a global sense and it spreads quickly. Yeah. Now, how, how do you think it, you know things have changed with like social media and the media the way it is now and how everything goes viral within like a day? You know, yeah, it, too fast. It, yeah, I mean that's completely <clears throat> has completely changed the way that we communicate. Mm. I mean, two thousand years ago, we didn't have Facebook and, and Twitter and. YouTube, we didn't have the ability to communicate information as, as quickly as we do today. So now, you know, it's funny, we just we did a radio show uh, just earlier this evening, and I, I kind of came up with a new term that kind of, uh, I think, hit it off with Marie and the, and the host. Do you remember it? Again. <laughs> uh, you know, nowadays, you've got these armchair commandos that, there you sit, go. <laughs> that sit behind their computers, and you put something out there, and before you know it, you know, with with the push of the uh, the inner key, it's seen worldwide, right? Yep. And you know that can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. I mean, when you compare how technology has enabled us to communicate, I mean, now between Google Translate, where you can now br- bridge every language barrier that there is, you can bridge time zones, you can bridge social and and um, cultural local cultures. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there there really is no. Divis- divisive line anymore, so you can communicate ideas basically in a to a global community. Whereas several thousand years ago, you know, you, you had a very limited ability to transfer that information. You had either oral tradition, you had things written down in caves or written on paper or papyrus. Right. Uh, you know, you didn't have quite the, uh, the breath that we do today. But can you imagine if uh, Jesus had Facebook or Twitter? Absolutely. <laughs> but, Wait a minute. Like, God is on can, Facebook and I, I Can you imagine like a, a Jesus selfie picture? Yeah. So that also brings up that brings up an interesting um, idea as well. The more people that you have that are receiving a message or receiving uh, information, the the more possibility that you'll have for uh, different interpretations of that information as well. Right. Yeah, so that's you've true. You've got yeah. all kinds of different um, biases. Each person has their own personal biases, religious, social, economic. When you throw all that stuff into the mix, your written words, what the, what the uh, armchair commandos are putting out there, may not necessarily be the actual – their intent – but it may very much be a case of your uh, interpretation of that. Yeah, that's so true. It's just, it's so easy now to take a simple piece of information and it becomes so adulterated by the time it reaches, you know, the 10th person down the line that it's no longer anything like how it started. Yet you've got people all along that route as the information travels, we're buying into that information as if it were gospel truth. And that's where we get into trouble with things are so easy now, it's so easy to communicate that we... I think uh, we're losing Marie. Uh, Marie, are you there? Yeah. Oh, okay, no, you're, you're coming in and out a little bit. Now. There's a little Uh-oh. bit of uh, weirdness going on with your signal. I know what it is. <laughs> They're trying to stop the message. Yeah, there it is. They don't want it to go viral. That's what's going yeah. on here. Exactly. It's the deem- It's the spirits of the liar. <laughs> but yeah, there's so much garbage information out there now that we have to weed through to get to the stuff that we really need in order to, you know, make our lives better. 
That's do you think it, do you think having all this social media stuff it can make things worse on us? I mean, do you think it's it's actually a worse? Uh, it's not actually helping mankind because I, I kind of get the feeling sometimes, especially when you have idiots like John Weiner putting his picture out on Twitter. Oh. I mean, that just destroyed his career. Sure, and that went viral within seconds. Sure, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. <laughs> Larry will probably laugh. I, 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 I'm a real hard worker. I mean, I work a lot, but I thought, God, I could probably double my output of books if I weren't on. Facebook and Twitter so much. And I really had to think about it. I mean, there is a reason why we go on there to promote our work, to make connections and network and all that stuff, and just to have fun and let off some steam. But I was thinking, wow, I got to be careful because there comes that point where your productivity goes down. You stop working on things that are important to you because you're so distracted by all of this social clutter. <clears throat> No, I completely agree. And, and distracted by having to put your entire life on Twitter, which is an amazing phenomenon, by the way. Uh, there's, pe- yeah. there's, there, there's people that literally uh, every second of the day, they're tweeting something. I'm like, I use, you know, I have to tweet, obviously, because that's the popular thing to do. You have to use it when you do a radio show. So eventually I put a tweet out, hey, I'm doing a radio show tonight. Or uh, something special happened. But I, there's people that, like, literally every 15 minutes, they're putting a tweet. Right. Look what I mean, I for breakfast. Right. Look what I had for a snack. Look what I had for lunch. Oh, I just just stepped out of the bathroom, going yeah. to the toilet. I'm yeah. like, really? I don't need to know your process during the day, my friend. That like, certain things you can keep to yourself. Like, yeah, that's funny. This is a, it's an incredible phenomenon, though. But uh, to me, it's almost like a dumbing down of society in a way with all the social yeah. media. Yeah. Because instead of people going and reading books and getting knowledge the old-fashioned way, the, going the proper way, Eight going outside and meeting people and yeah. having that, that interaction. Everybody Everybody's at their, inside of their houses on their computers, uh, tweeting, uh, on their cell phone, tweeting. You know, that, that connection between people is completely uh, disappearing, and that's scary. Yeah. It is, it is. And, you know, uh, you got to wonder, is this all being done to us on purpose? I mean, is this a, a form of ma- manipulation? I don't, you know, no, not a government conspiracy, but I really <laughs> think more media in terms of advertising. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you're not that far off because who invented the Internet, yeah. after all? Yeah, I mean, find a way Government. to addict people. We are an addictive species. So find a way to get them hooked and then, you know, start with the advertising and, and all of the, the money-making stuff. Yeah, it's a tough one. But, yeah, I, I think personally we all need to check ourselves and say, okay, you know, what else could I be doing? Am I really having such a good time here? <laughs> and sometimes you do. You know, sometimes you just want to goof off and interact. And other times, though, I think people use it as a crutch or a distraction to avoid maybe they're miserable in their personal lives or they, they're they afraid to go for their, their dreams or their goals. And it's a perfect distraction. Now, let me ask you, with the way media and, and social media is now, in about 20 years, let's say you two are writing books still together, and you decide to write a follow-up to viral mythology, how do you think, you know, trying to envision the way uh, mythology is changing and evolving, uh, how would how do you think that book would take place? Do you think it would be uh, completely different to the mythologies we're having now? Like, will it include chapters on, like, Justin Bieber and... And Sharknado. <laughs> and Sharknado <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, you can take that one since you have to go soon. Yeah, no, I, I think it would. I, you know, I think our cultural means are certainly uh, unique to this to this day and age. I mean, if you look back, I'm a child of the '80s, so if I same look, here, you, brother. You look yeah. back and you you look at all the things that were popular, things that were of interest in the news back in the '80s, and you mm-hmm. look at them today, they seem just just ridiculous by comparison. So I think I think very much, you know, 20 years from now, if we wrote a book about about 2014, it'd be very similar to that. We'd be looking back at at the bell bottoms, and we'd be looking at the peg jeans, and we'd be looking at the parachute pants. It'd be the same type of thing, just in a different time. Right. And here's another <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Here's a different question. What is the saddest, uh, I guess, uh, age to write about? Uh, you know, now, you know, I guess this century, past century, oh, uh, when you have to look at a, at a viral stuff or things that went viral. What is the, the, I guess, the ages that make you the, like the saddest for humanity? 
the Dark Ages. I mean, the, I mean, it has the name Dark Ages for a reason, right? I mean, yeah, you know, it, it was. I would it was dark. Have, I, well, I'm sure you know if you believe in reincarnation, we were alive then at some point, but. <laughs> <laughs> what a brutal time. Talk about ideas and information. That was a time when you were not permitted to have an idea or spread information that was not church approved. And uh, and people paid with their lives and they were tortured. And and not only that, but people looked like they stunk in those days. I mean, geez. Yeah, you know? I, don't think, I don't think they were very sanitary back in those oh. times. Yeah. I don't know. Larry, what do you think? What would be your uh, saddest time? If Running you know, in water wasn't, a, I think, a priority back in the Dark Ages. You know, I, I, I don't <laughs> want to get. Too, <laughs> I, I definitely don't want to get too controversial on this show. Um, you know, I think it certainly would. That would be one of the times. But you know, also, I think now, I think we're right. Hey. Go, yeah, I really do. We're going through agree. Yeah. a tremendous loss of our civil rights. Yep. We're going through. We're going through a lot of things now um, that I, I think. If you look back 100, 200 years ago, our founding fathers certainly didn't have the intent of where things are going today. So I think, you know, if you project it in the future and you look back at 2010, 2012, 2013, 2014, these, these times now, I think people are going to look back at us and think, well, that was the, those were the times where we willingly gave up things that were, that were our rights if that makes any sense. But I don't want to get too deep into pol politics on the show and any of that. But, uh, yeah, I certainly I think that we are at a, we're in a dark period now. Yeah, you know, I, I tend to agree with you. I think in, in I would have to say the last hundred and uh, 114 years. And uh, that, and I would say that because I think uh, everything from the Kennedy era, uh, sure. Hitler, what he did, uh, the, you know, the Nazi era, I mean, all that is just horrible, horrible stuff. So sure. the last century and 14 years now have not been fun. No. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, just a lot of bad events. And there's been good events also, but it, it, a lot of mythology has been built up in the last hundred yes, years. Yes, I see it completely different. I think that we've come such a long way from... You know, the time when the church wielded so much power that you either believed in the God that they told you to believe in or you were burned at the stake. And That's very true. Yeah. You know, gotta, plus, yeah. If we are spoiled rotten. Let's face it. We have a lot of things today. We have, you know, heated homes with running water and true. toilets and things like that. Um, <laughs> toilets. Yeah, but, yeah. Know, I also think we have this it's age. anymore. <laughs> As the intelligence and and the wherewithal to make things better for our the next few generations, if we want to, as opposed to you know during the Inquisitions, that's it, you were dead, and so are your kids. Right. So there really was no future for them to be hopeful about. But that's you know I, I think this is a good time because if we're careful about not letting technology take over our humanity, we might actually pull out. Pull out of it and be better for it. I completely agree, but I think technology is uh, making us lazy in many ways. Yeah, unfortunately. So is everyone I know is miserable, and you know when you ask them why, well, there's things that I'd like to do. Why aren't you doing them? Well, right. well, okay, go write the great American novel. Go become a marathon or whatever. Right. It's yeah, it's made us lazy and it's made us give up on our own potential in a lot of ways. And, and again, it, it's made us forget to uh, have that interaction with other people. That human connection is being lost completely. You know what it is? We're becoming, in many ways, uh, a, a race of people that eventually are going to be so disconnected from each other where it's going to be almost like we're robots or robotic, you know, at, at one point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I think we're, gonna, I think we're, we're all we're plugging headed, into the matrix. We're, we're headed in that direction now. I mean, if you go out exactly, here, yeah. And you look around at the tables all around you. How many people are on their phones? Oh, even mother, even parents and their kids. Yeah, people are breaking up with each other via text. I mean, come on. You, you know, know that kills me when. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's. I, I know a couple of people of that that the same exact thing happened to them, and and when they've told me, oh, my girlfriend just broke up with me, I'm like, really? Via text? Uh, what happened to calling at least? You know, what, yeah. was that like two 1990s? At least they called you. <laughs> yeah, nobody calls you anymore. No. Anyway, I'll, I'll let Larry fi finish up because I know he has to go. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, Larry, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Well, uh, no, actually, uh, we're at the end of the hour. Um, real quick, before we let you go, we're actually going to hit a break in, in a second here. Um, Larry, give everybody your website, um, anything uh, you're promoting besides the book. We're going to talk more about the book when we come back from break. But um, anything that you want to promote, like a website or anything, uh, so the audience can follow your work. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, Marie and I have a website together. Uh, it's paraexplorers.com, P-A-R-A-E-X-P-L-O-R-E-R-S.com. And that you can kind of use that to keep up with all of our writing and projects and speaking and all that stuff together. Um, my personal website is www.larryflaxman.com. And my website is – or my paranormal group website, I'm sorry – it's www.arpast.org. Very cool. And are you going to be uh, speaking anywhere uh, in the near future? Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I think this is a, a source of continuous frustration for Marie, but yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, what? Where? Me? What? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. Um, coming up, uh, I'm doing, gosh, a bunch of stuff. I've got... Memphis Comic Con in March. Uh, then I'll be doing um, an event with Chip Coffee in Little Rock on April 5th. Uh, April 12th, I'm doing a big event down in Jefferson, Texas called History Haunts and Legends. Uh, April, I'm sorry, May 9th and 10th, I'm doing a charity in Boonville, Arkansas. You're going to start hearing me growling in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, He's I can go to write a book with me. That's why. <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing a bunch of stuff. I've got throughout the through the end of the year, I've got at least one weekend uh, a month that I'm traveling to speak. Very cool. So. Now you said you're gonna you you said you're gonna be at a comic con also. Yeah, I'm gonna be at the Memphis Comic Con in uh, what is that March in March? Uh, yeah, the weekend of the twenty second, twenty first through the twenty third. Oh, very cool. So anybody out there listening in Memphis? Check that out. Uh, we have a, a huge following with the comic book community. So it's a comic book uh, comic con, right? Yeah, it's it's the mid. I think they call it Mid South Con. Uh, oh, okay. But it's the Memphis version of Comic Con. Yeah. Very cool, Larry. We have to have you back on the show uh, for yeah. a longer show, man. I love having you on. Um, definitely, uh, as soon as you can come back out, please let me know. I want to actually uh, segue a little bit, Marie, into your interest in ufology and. Um, you know, let's let's get into that a little bit. Like, what got you interested in ufology to begin with? Because with me, it was a personal experience. I originally had uh, my own sighting in uh, when I was a child, and that got me in, interested in it. Uh, what did it for you that got you interested in it originally? No, I mean, I my parents, my dad's passed away, but my parents told me that I was into UFOs and aliens and Martians specifically, <laughs> when, when I was like a toddler. I don't remember having a, a sighting of any kind. Nobody in my family remembers one. I remember around the age of seven have a, having a very intense dream of a little gray alien, and it, it just haunted me all my life. So I've always wondered, hmm, I wonder if that really was a dream or if something really happened. But I just don't. There's nothing definitive. I would read books. Um, I was obsessed with it, and it stayed that way all through my life so that I got into MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, Center for UFO Studies. I worked with Fund for UFO Research for a while. I did a, a report that I had gotten some grant money from them to do, and that was all through my teens, my 20s, into my 30s. I stopped. I was actually involved with um, Los Angeles MUFON. And I formed a group here in northern San Diego County with another gal because there was a group. San Diego was a huge county. There was a group down uh, downtown area. We formed our own group, and it was very successful. Had some weird stuff go down that kind of made me walk away from it all. I'll just put it that way. Um, I had a what can only be described as a men in black encounter. And actually, I allowed Nick Redfern, who I'm sure you know, to write about it in his Oh, yeah. Black I've, book. Had, I've had him on the show several times, actually. the now. first person I ever told my story to and allowed to write about it. Oh, no kidding. Really, yeah, I walked away. I mean, and there was someone who was harassing me that I wasn't quite sure if he was human. Let's just put it that way. And to the point where this person knew things about me that he shouldn't have. Um, 
and or could see things going on. And at the time, I lived in this little apartment at the top of a hill, and I would close all the blinds and everything. Yet this person could see things going on in my apartment that he shouldn't have been able to. And it just kind of creeped me out to the point where I thought, you know what? I'm going to walk away from the group aspect and just focus on writing. So I wrote about UFOs in a couple of books. It, they, it, it's one of those topics that, like ghosts and cryptids and anything else paranormal, it's interesting that a lot of times the possible explanations can cover all of those subjects, not just UFOs. So right. I'm still very much interested. The only time in my life I thought that I had a sighting uh, the object was so far away that I really couldn't be sure. It just behaved a little erratically. I was very familiar with what to look for, and I knew how to identify identifiable objects, and it just looked really unusual. But that's the closest I've ever come. It just was a fascination of mine. My father is a geophysicist, and he was obsessed with UFOs too, which is you know, really interesting because scientists – were really, he and his colleagues, a lot of them were really into UFOs, but they couldn't talk about it openly. They had to get together, like at our house, they would get together and sit around the kitchen table and smoke and drink beer. And I would sit at my dad's feet, I was really little, maybe five, six, seven at the time, and listen to them talk about UFOs. And these are brilliant physicists and geophysicists, seismologists, oceanographers, they would all come hang out at my house. You know, my, I'm my, starting to think that you were in the toddler that was interested in UFOs. They were, and you just kind of like became a fan because you heard Dad talk about uh, it. No, I mean, I was, I, I wrote a book when I was five years old called Life on Mars. Are you serious? I couldn't I mean, even spell my name when I was five years old. Yeah, I wrote a whole book. I had a cover. My mom helped me bind the cover with, like, shoestrings. It was all about living on Mars and being an astronaut. I was really into that. I started reading and writing when I was, like, 18 months. And I was really interested in telling ghost stories and aliens. I thought Bigfoot lived in my backyard. So somehow I had heard about Bigfoot stories when I was really young. Um, and I know, like, there were certain shows that were on TV at the time. Uh, in search of was one of them, Leonard. Well, here, here's a question that I'm, that uh, we've got in the chat room. Well, actually, two questions. Uh, they want to know why is your audio skipping? Uh, I don't know. I'm sitting, not moving. Are well, you on a? You are you on an iPad or? A I have an iMac, but let me tell you something. I, Larry, too bad he's not on because he could attest to this. I am a negative technology. Energy train. <laughs> we got to get you a headset because I love having you on the show and I'd love Even to have you back on. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Where I go, technology fails. I'm not well, kidding. You, the thing is, you sound fine. Oh, it's just no. there's like a there's like a, 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 a hiccup. But anyway, the, another question I'm getting in the chat room here is about the the real society. Speaking of mythology and, U, and UFOs, uh, have you done any uh, research into the real society? I never even heard of it. Vril? Never heard of the real society. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, that's a troublesome topic, actually. That's that's a tough one. Um, it's a book. It deals with uh, UFOs and aliens and stuff, but you've never heard of it. so uh, it's There's a million books out there on aliens and UFOs. And, no, I, I you know, because I'm writing now about broader subjects, I tend to focus more on the books that talk about UFOs in terms of uh, being interdimensional or have scientific some kind of scientific angle to them, but no, I well, it, it deals. I don't know if you're too familiar with uh, the Nazi Germans and their yeah. uh, alien uh, connection, UFO connection. It deals oh, with that. Absolutely. Yeah, I wrote about that in Science. And yeah. you've never heard of the Vril Society, really? It just doesn't. It's not ringing a bell right now, Vril. We got we got to get we got to get you a headset, have you back on in a couple months, and I'm going to give you some information about the real society, and we got to talk again because I'd love to hear what you think okay. of after yeah. you read this book. It's amazing. Uh, no, but uh, I'm not going to get too into the, uh, the 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 whole real society, uh, but I will say that um, it, you know Nazi Germany and you know people believe that they might have had uh, UFO, UFOs or, or whatever. Uh, I don't think you know Nazi Germany particularly had UFOs because if they did, they would have won that war, man. How do you lose when you have extraterrestrial crafts that you could fly around and shoot lasers at people? Like they were heavily involved in anti-gravity research. They did have prototypes. 
and a couple of their scientists were brought over here to America as part of Operation Paperclip, where we willingly brought over a lot of Nazi scientists to help advance our knowledge, kind of a dark moment in our history. Um, but they never quite got it off the ground, pun intended. Uh, but they did right. <laughs> start a lot of research. They had a lot of really unusual ideas. That, you know, Hitler was obsessed with the occult. Definitely, Anything yeah. Involving the occult, ghosts, UFOs, demons. You know, he was that just he was. Yep. So he poured money into that kind of research. Those scientists were evil, but they were brilliant. And that's why they were brought over here to the States after World War II to secretly assist our research. And I just think they, you know, we don't know how far they got with anything, but I don't think they ever really got those prototypes off the ground, so to no, speak. No, I, I, I don't think so either, but I do find it amazing, uh, Marie, that uh, they did inherit all the scientists from Nazi Germany into the American Yeah, isn't that nice, huh? You huh? Know, like, gee, you know, you were responsible for this atrocity, but hey, we'd love to pick your brains. Come on over. Yeah, come on over. We'll give you American passports. Nobody yeah, would know uh, the difference. Put you up in a mansion in Florida. You'll be fine. <laughs> Nobody would know the difference. In fact, uh, because of uh, their work, we ended up on the moon. That's one of the things later. that I what, always wanted to write a book about. Larry and I had thought about pitching the definitive book on Operation Paperclip, and we ended up writing, I think, our time travel book instead at that time. But that's a, it's a fascinating subject and part of our history that not a lot of people uh, you know, in the general public are aware of. Which is funny, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, it just shows you if... If you want to keep information from people, just distract them with something else. Like Justin <laughs> yeah. Bieber and yeah, nonsense that we get in the media. Give them nonsense, and they won't focus on the fact that we're coddling Nazi scientists. You know, I've always wondered, uh, Marie, and I don't know if you have ever uh, even wondered this, but do you think that there's a possibility that Hitler didn't get killed and he survived? He may have after, you know, I mean, he's certainly dead now. He'd be quite old. Well, but obviously, yeah. Yeah, I think he may have been. Unless he's an alien and he's living somewhere. Or he found the, the uh, fountain of youth. Yeah. I think he could have and could have just been scuttled away somewhere to live out his days. Who knows? Um, I know. Well, who was the one who escaped to uh, Brazil? Was it Mengele? You know, they may have, who knows, were there witnesses to his death? That's what I'm trying to remember. Well, it's an odd thing because his body, I guess, was found burnt or crisp, and it was hard to, so uh, to identify. Yeah, it was hard to identify. Right. Uh, but yeah. it, it was uh, supposedly identified as, as being his body by relatives. But what does that tell us? Yeah, really. <laughs> you know? That, that doesn't tell me much. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's been talk over the years, which I don't know if you've covered this in the book uh, or if you've ever researched into this but uh there uh there's been of course uh talk about the, the nazis uh using the, the north pole or the, or the south pole as uh, a point of entry uh to try to get into like the hollow earth and uh try to or try to get into some in you know parts of the earth that there oh, might be portions the the you know the, the deepest part of the earth is a molten core I mean, yeah. scientists are pretty savvy with. <laughs> I mean, have you done any research at all into the hollow Earth theory? I mean, there do, are do you maybe that pockets all? of hollowness here and there that uh, you know. I mean, it, cave dwellers, who knows? But that's always fascinated me because we do know. I mean, we can actually identify, you know, the layers. <laughs> that make up the earth from the core on outward. But yeah, I mean, there could be pockets of, of livable space just below the surface. I mean, certainly there are a lot of underground bunkers and things like that. So why not? But the earth is not hollow. We do know that. It would be I, you know, weird I, if it was hollow, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be just the, <laughs> I would, I don't understand how that would work. I mean, I, I, in fact, one of my friends uh, for a long time, Dennis Crenshaw, the Hollow Earth Insider himself, has the website, thehollowearthinsider.com. Shout outs to him. Uh, we've gotten into that argument before because I really don't know how, how scientifically that would even it work. It would be impossible. I mean, get a geologist, get a geophysicist, get, uh, you know, people that know, uh, volcanologists, all of those people will tell you. It's just, it's not possible. How, how do you think? Exactly. You know, what, just what, the 
pressure, the layers of the earth that are compressing in on that core. Right. Nothing would be able to survive there unless it was bacterial, maybe. Not only that, the way it's described, because they describe it as it's like a middle sun or a little sun within the earth, uh, then, okay, I understand that. But let's say you're on the other side of the surface, right? Uh, the other surface, which the interior surface, let's just say, for example. Wouldn't you be too close to that sun to be able to You'd live? You'd be dead. You'd be fried. <laughs> You'd be extra crispy. You'd you know. be crispy. <laughs> well, maybe there's this, like a race of you know, crispy people. <laughs> crispy critters. That live I mean, there. I'm not saying there can't be life down there, but it certainly wouldn't be any, you know, it might be microbial if even that would survive. Although yeah, I guess well, well, can survive in all kinds of different conditions. So. Yeah, no, I, I do think there will be some kind of microbial, even insect type of life. Because, I mean, we found uh, life in the, the weirdest and most remote parts of the planet, uh, in, in the ocean, deep, deep, deep in the oh, ocean. When yeah, you wouldn't think there's, there's, there's yeah. There's stuff there's, down there we still don't know. That's correct. really kind of cool to think that here we are chasing ghosts and aliens and the deepest part of our oceans, are, we're still finding new species of bizarre-looking creatures. I think that's cool. Maria, this is the craziest thing. We know less about our own oceans than we do about outer space. What does that yeah. tell you about yeah, humanity? Yeah, so that's something. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? Uh, Maria, we're almost out of time. I know you've you got to go in a little while here, but I, I want to definitely give you a chance to... Uh, uh, plug everything that you're working on in the near future. Uh, I want to have you back on the show also. Absolutely. Uh, so, so we Absolutely. could talk. It's been a lot of fun having you on. But uh, please plug uh, your website again. I know that uh, Larry gave it earlier. Yeah. but My personal, well, Larry gave you the other websites. Larry and I, our website is paraexplorers.com. My personal website is mariedjones.com. And I'm on Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Uh, other than viral mythology, we actually have another book out that's called The Grid, Exploring the Hidden Infrastructure of Reality. And it's kind of a culmination nice. of the work that we've done into the paranormal uh, and alternate realities and how we may be accessing them at any given time. Oh, I'm so going to check that one out and read that too. one, yeah. Yeah, it's really great. It's It's got a lot of paranormal stuff in it that really it culminates the seven years of research Larry and I have done together and also what we were doing alone before we came together to work together and just sort of put it into our idea of, hey, this might explain what's going on here, what reality is and the fact that there are other levels of reality as well that, there were, that we're experiencing. And, you know, that's a perfect question to end with uh, there real quick. Let me ask you before I let you go, Marie. Uh -huh. What do you think reality is? I don't think there's just one. I think that there are possibly an infinite number. I think that our reality is what we consciously focus on at the time. And I know that we might call paranormal experiences or events times when we're focusing on a different reality. Um, so to me, the reality that I am living and that you're living right now is simply the one that your consciousness is fixed and focused on. But that does not mean that there aren't other realities right outside of your field of perception. And it just requires a shift in focus. You know, the perfect example of what you just said is uh, the, the fish to human para uh, paradox, where a fish doesn't know anything about us until we stick our hand in the water and interact yeah, with them. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that is a perfect way to end the uh, the segment here. Marie, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank uh, you. Again, love having you on. Please come back and, uh, and hang out with us again here on Inside Tackle. I Tackles. will. So you invite me and I'll come on. Thank you so much. Have yourself a wonderful evening and uh, take care. Bye-bye.